Good morning. My name is Lindsay Newton and I work with community engagement at the Missouri Historical Society. And on behalf of MHS, I would like to welcome you this morning and thank you for coming to STL History Live. We are excited for you to join us virtually for The River Connects Us All in collaboration with the Mississippi River Cities and Towns Initiative. This program is inspired by our special exhibit, The Mighty Mississippi. You can see a slide on the screen here. Through a mix of historic artifacts, images, and media, the Mighty Mississippi exhibit sheds light on how sustaining surrounding communities has long depended on wisely caring for the river environment and its resources. And that's sort of what we are going to be talking more about today. Safety is a top priority for us at MHS. And thus nearly all of our programming is virtual for the time being, but the museum is open. Wednesday through Sunday, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. each day. And there's several safety precautions in place. So we would love for you to visit our mighty Mississippi exhibit if you feel safe and able to come out. That exhibit is open through June 6th. So a couple more months, you've got to see it. And the mighty Mississippi is presented by Bank of America. So we wanna send this huge thank you out to our, our presenters today. And also a heartfelt thank you to JSM Charitable Trust who is the education sponsor for this exhibit. We also want to acknowledge our members. I know many of you watching today are members of MHS and without your support, this work could not be possible. And last but certainly not least, we appreciate the support from the Zoo Museum Tax District. We sincerely thank you for your tax contributions. So just mentioning quickly a few details about how today's program will run. There will be time for questions from the audience at the end of the conversation. You can submit your questions through the Q&A button in your toolbar anytime. Um, and today's presentation is being recorded. So if you'd like to view it again, share it with friends or family who might've missed out, it will go on our YouTube channel within the next day or two. Check it out there. And then also your feedback is important to us. We would really appreciate if you could answer a few questions about this program afterward. A Kobo toolbox survey will open in another tab on your browser. It might have already opened. So keep an eye out for that when you leave the session. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Colin Wellenkamp, the Executive Director of the Mississippi River Cities and Towns Initiative, who will tell you a little bit more about MRCTI and also introduce our guest presenter today. Colin, thank you for being here and thank you so much for your partnership. Thank you, Lindsay. It's uh, great to be here. Really appreciate and value the museum's invitation. The Missouri History Museum is certainly a gem on the Mississippi River. And uh, being born and raised in Missouri, uh, I've always loved it as a constant companion and a link to everything that makes us uh, what we are today, uh, past, present, and future. Uh, something else that links us so closely, besides the museum, is the Mississippi River itself. And that's what we're here to, to talk about. <clears throat> and we're very honored uh, to be kicking off the, the final season of the exhibit uh, to June 6th. We're excited about uh, this, this opportunity. Uh, joining me is the co-chair of our association, the mayor of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Mayor Sharon Weston Broom. Uh, before I bring her on, though, just a, a, a quick note on who we are exactly and what it is our association does. Now, we are an association of 100 United States mayors along the Mississippi River in 10 states from uh, going north to south, Bemidji, Minnesota, to New Orleans, Louisiana, and everybody in between. We're headquartered here in St. Louis, Missouri. And Mayor Francis Slade was one of our founding mayors of our association back in 2012. So we have a very strong connection to both St. Louis and Missouri itself. I've had past work and partnership with the museum and it has been very valuable. We're very happy to be here today and have been excited about the exhibit uh, pandemic permitting, of course. So what it is that our association of mayors do, well, it is, all mayors. So you have to be a mayor of a municipality directly adjacent to the main stem Mississippi River in order to be a member of our group. 
and it uh, doesn't matter the size of the municipality. So we have a very diverse cohort of cities as small as 164 people, like Kimswick, Missouri, just south of here, and cities as large as 3 million people, much like the Twin Cities metropolitan region. And the largest city on the Mississippi by population and square mileage is actually Memphis. Um, the Twin Cities, New Orleans, St. Louis are actually not quite as big uh, as Memphis. But our mayors came together uh, back in 2012 to really forge this alliance and speak as one voice for our corridor because it is so important to the nation and the world. And Mayor Broom is actually going to talk about more about that in a minute. I'm the executive director of the association, and with our staff both here and in Washington, D.C., we work to facilitate all the things that our mayors do to elevate our region uh, to a national priority. And I will say this, it doesn't have to be wet for us to care about it. So if it's important to our cities, it's important to our association. There's a lot of things that touch that river and our geography, like broadband deployment, schools, uh, energy, uh, city grid restoration, all of these issues that aren't necessarily water related issues, but they're very important to the corridor and the valley. And we work on those as well. But I would say the magic of this association is watching these mayors work from very diverse backgrounds, very diverse geographies, from way up north to in the middle to the bayou and the delta. It is amazing to see them collect around uh, this asset that we call the Mississippi and really push for its future, its resilience, and it being sustained. One of our great leaders that does that the best is our co-chair. Uh, we are led by an executive committee of 10 mayors, one from each state, as well as two co-chairs, Mayor Bob Gallagher of Bettendorf, Iowa, which is north of me, and a bit south, Mayor of Baton Rouge, Sharon Weston Broom, uh, who has just been a tremendous champion and advocate for all the way up the river, uh, all the way to Minnesota, and really uh, has established national leadership for, for our corridor. We are very thankful and lucky to have her, her vision and all of her energy. And uh, she leads, leads a city 300 years young uh, this year. So without further ado, uh, Mayor Broom, please take it away. Thank you so much, Colin, for that introduction. I also want to thank Lindsay Newton, the Director of Education and Engagement, uh, for working with us to bring MRCTI into this important set of conversations around the museum's Mississippi River exhibit. So this morning, I would like to present on three things to bring focus to our dialogue together how we as 100 mayors work together along the Mississippi River corridor to accomplish priorities for our region. Secondly, to provide profile for you some of our most recent accomplishments. And third, and touch on the work ahead and how we intend to keep pursuing our agenda for this new Congress and new administration. First, I think it's important to understand the vastness of the resource our cities are working so hard to sustain. The Mississippi is the most important river in the world. It is 20% larger than China's Yellow River, double that of the Nile and India's river, 15 times larger than the Rhine River. Only the Amazon and Congo have larger drainage basins, but neither the Congo or the Amazon can hardly compare to the length of the Mississippi that is navigable. The Mississippi River Basin produces 40% of the world's food supply. One in 12 people consume commodities grown in the basin. Our region is the most important food producing river basin on earth. It is the reason our cities exist. It is our most powerful draw and it provides the environmental services we depend on for quality of life. The way MRCTI brings mayors together is through our two annual meetings, one in Washington DC every March and one in the region every mid 
September. In fact, my city of Baton Rouge will be hosting our 2021 annual meeting, September 14th through 16th, to mark our 300th anniversary here in Baton Rouge. But beyond just meetings, MRCTI, as an association, works to uh, lift our corridor collectively, as well as help our individual cities with their local projects and priorities. This 50-50 mandate is unique among multi-state associations of cities. I would also point out that we have no limits on size of municipalities that can join. There are communities from 164 people to over 3 million that are part of MRCTI. Finally, we work closely with the Mississippi River Caucus in the US House and Senate to forward the interest of our region. Linking various levels of government from the local to the federal is key to getting uh, and gaining the type of investment that our mayors uh, need for our work. Just a sample of some of the things that we have accomplished. Recently, we realized over $300 million for Section 319 water pollution grants to secure our water supply. We realized over $300 million for pre-disaster mitigation to protect our economy and jobs. We wrote and proposed the Resilience Revolving Loan Fund Act, which was enacted January 1st, 2021. We secured a landmark agreement with three federal agencies on water quality monitoring, which involves river cruise vessels carrying USGS water sensors. We realized 27 million dollars for the Marine Highway Grant Program to improve American global trade. We partnered with TNC to pass a lower Mississippi River habitat assessment in the Word of 2018 to restore natural infrastructure vital to resilience. We've also deployed two environmental impact bonds in the region to restore natural infrastructure. We actually just completed our 2021 Washington DC meeting on March 4th. So let me detail some of the outcomes of that virtual gathering. At this capital uh, meeting took place, uh, or should I say when this capital meeting took place, several repeating things came to light that we were made prevalent through, that were made prevalent throughout our discussions. COVID-19 has laid bare vulnerabilities throughout our region that we need to address immediately. Much of what we discuss with federal leaders supports recovery work from the pandemic. The renewed drive by the administration to arrive at a climate solution is something we support in a broad sense, but that drive cannot leave middle, middle America behind. And this actually gets to my last point in terms of what we need to do to move our region forward in the near term with this Congress and administration. President Biden's climate agenda is something we welcome, but it will not be successful unless it includes middle, middle America. And we have a plan for our region to contribute to the nation's progress around climate. Now, if you don't have a seat for middle America at the table, then the efforts culminating in Glasgow, Scotland this coming November during COP26 will not garner lasting public support in the US enough to ensure prolonged results beyond just our next election. The centerpiece of our plan to garner climate performance in the Mississippi River corridor is our proposed Safeguarding the Mississippi River Together or SMART Act, which we just unveiled in Congress on March 3rd. Our proposal will allow cities to transform their economies from polluted industrial to clean manufacturing and tourism. Our bill gives resources to states 
to secure their water quality. So the 456 billion freshwater economy of the corridor can expand and thrive. The SMART Act also calls for the development of a comprehensive Mississippi River restoration plan and the establishment of a national Mississippi River program office to both restore our ecology, mitigate for disasters, sequester carbon, and make our region more resilient. If you look at our federal policy platform, we unveiled to Congress this month, you will see recommendations and increased resources for such programs as the USDA Rural Reconnect Pilot Program, the Rural Community Facilities Program, the Department of Commerce Public Works Grant Program, and the Scenic Byways Program. All of these spending lines offer support for virtual working and learning. They augment our ability to increase services and distribute critical resources such as PPE and vaccines and help recover the tourism industry, which is one of the most vital industries to our region and one of the hardest hit. The nation continues to reel from the 10 million jobs still not recovered and the prospect of losing between three to four trillion dollars in GDP over the next two years. Through the pandemic, we learned we needed our facilities like food, banks, and community centers more than ever. Further, broadband connectivity and interoperability have become some of the most essential tools to keeping our economy afloat. It makes no sense to become complacent and think there will not be another pandemic. There are programs that can help us prepare and be more resilient to the next one if we invest appropriately. Take it from a region that is used to persistent disaster impacts and is implementing solutions to those impacts. Through 2021 and beyond, we are recommending to the administration that the president vest the Mississippi River Corridor as a partner in climate work because our region can offer leverage to the international community that will gain additional results. Here's what I mean. From the Port of St. Paul to the International Port of Memphis, down to the Port of Baton Rouge, the Port of Southern Louisiana, and the Port of New Orleans, you have a $164 billion global commodity export operation. Over 40% of all agriculture output of the U.S. moves on our Mississippi River. One in every 12 people on earth in just commodities produced in the Mississippi River Basin. The port of southern Louisiana is the largest port in the U.S. by tonnage. Canada, Mexico, China, and the European Union comprise the Mississippi River Basin's top trading partners. If the president can show the global community that he is committed to climate performance in middle America to sustain the global commodity supply chain, that will demonstrate to the world that the U.S. is serious about a climate solution and is prepared to implicate not just the coast, but the nation's vast and more trade impacting interior. So what does climate performance look like in middle America? Here's what we are recommending fully fund the Resilience Revolving Loan Fund at $100 million for fiscal year 2022. Create the position of the White House Chief Resilience Officer to ensure that the more than half billion we're spending annually on resilience is having the greatest effect and is supported by a mandate that pervades the federal portfolio. And of course, pass our Smart Act proposal. But we're certainly not relying completely on the federal government to bring all of our solutions home. We're pursuing plenty of our own partnerships. On March 3rd, we were very pleased to launch our Plastic Pollution Initiative in partnership with the United Nations Environmental Environment Program North America, National Geographic, and the University of Georgia. Together, we will deploy a cell phone app 
that enables anyone to be a citizen scientist and take part in our effort to audit the entire Mississippi River corridor. Anyone can download the app. Simply take pictures on your phone through the app of litter you encounter and the data is uploaded to the software that will catalog the location, type of plastic, brand if discernible, and in time we will have critical data that shows us where plastic is, what kind it is, and how much on the surface and who it belongs to. This will inform policy at a whole new level so that we can make the best choices around plastics. I'm very happy that St. Paul, St. Louis, and Baton Rouge have been selected as the pilot cities to roll this out initially with new cities coming online in their near term. Also on March 4th, our mayor signed a historic and innovative agreement with Ducks Unlimited. MRCTI leadership and Admin Putman, CEO of Ducks Unlimited, signed a memorandum of common purpose to deploy natural infrastructure assets, such as wetlands and marshes throughout the Mississippi River corridor to provide both habitat and disaster protection for our cities. As part of this agreement, we will first embark on an initial project to deploy natural infrastructure in three locations in the upper middle and lower regions of the river valley. If this pilot phase sets up well, and if, it's, if it is successful, we will bring more projects online as capacity allows. Areas that are most likely to be selected for the pilot include those subject to repetitive, uh, good for uh, waterfall, I'm sorry, repetitive laws, good for waterfall, foul, and whose scale is achievable in the near term. We also believe this effort can add to the president's uh, 30 by 30 plan to conserve 30% of the nation's land by 2030, as well as provide additional capacity to sequester carbon through the infrastructure we restore and or install. I know this has been a lot to take in, but we have a vast expanse to protect our 100 cities that need help. I'm happy now to get to any questions and dialogue that you might have. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm not seeing any questions from our audience just yet, but Mayor Broom, thank you so much for sharing your experience and all of your, your knowledge. Um, it, was, it was fascinating to hear about some of the projects you've been doing, especially in this, this you know, that unprecedented word that is overused, but really <laughs> unprecedented year of, of COVID. Um, you let know, I'm- just, Let me just- yeah. Let me say that um, I uh, really have great admiration um, uh, for the present um, exhibit you have at your museum. And I would love to, I can tell you that my mind is moving because I'd love to have such an exhibit here on this end of the Mississippi uh, River. I'm sure it's very insightful and um, meaningful. Yeah. Yeah. You know, could you maybe tell us about something? Um, has there ever been something you've accomplished that surprised you that you thought just wouldn't have been possible and somehow working together with mayors along the river? Well, that maybe had an unexpected outcome or? Well, you know, I one of the, uh, things that I love about MRCTI, which you heard me say at the very beginning, is that to me, we are an example of what it means to have shared goals and shared visions as leaders, regardless of your political party, your ideology, and focus on the mighty Mississippi. And it's so, uh, to me, I think there's so many messages around uh, what we do as as mayors uh, focusing on uh, the river. Now, 
what have we accomplished? As I shared with you, a lot of our, when we go to Washington DC and make our requests known, the fact that we've made progress on the um, uh, resilience revolving loan, uh, that is a tremendous outcome uh, for us because I saw how we were in the, you know, that we've been very consistent in pushing that forward. I believe that we will see uh, a positive outcome um, because we have talked with the Biden administration, President Biden's administration, around the whole issue uh, surrounding, um, you know, climate change and the fact that we are all unified around a goal of making sure that middle America is not left out of this dialogue. Uh, and so, I, you know, our, our federal outcomes have certainly been uh, good. I will tell you during the pandemic, as we rallied together with some of our uh, uh, private partnerships, we were able to help stand up cities with uh, PPE, um, uh, and so that, you know, showed, I believe, the, the, um, the impact um, that MRCTI has uh, in terms of our partnerships that exist and, and how we are not just an organization that gets together around conferences, and, uh, but we are also uh, some doers, you know, we, we like to get work done and we uh, have seen success around, as I said, when I started out collaborating and working and focused on shared goals. And that primary goal is the mighty Mississippi River. Are there ever times when it feels challenging to you to balance the focus on the Mississippi River with other needs in your community? Like, are there people that argue the environmental issues aren't the most important thing right now? And like, I'm just wondering how you navigate the need to balance all sorts of priorities yeah. and how you might show that they are all connected. Yes, uh, you know, um, I never get any um, pushback about making the environment or the river uh, uh, part of the priority. Actually, you know, let's face it, the Mississippi River is an integral part of the fabric of my community and of many of the other mayor's uh, communities. So the residents, the people understand, for example, um, you know, we, we talked about the, the value of the port that exists here. Um, you know, one of the most scenic locations is the bluff at Southern University, which uh, overlooks the, um, the river. Right now, um, as you heard about the pilot program surrounding plastic pollution, uh, we're, we're working to make sure that that doesn't, um, you know, become the environmental issue of the, the age on the Mississippi uh, River. And our residents certainly understand that. And, and, and at the end of the day, we live in an area where water <laughs> and, and Mississippi is the largest part of that water. Water is a way of life for us. And not only water, but water management. And whether that's you know uh, the, uh, the surrounding environmental issues, or whether that's uh, uh, surrounding flood mitigation, all of these are are, are part of uh, our issues. So to answer your original question, Lindsay, no, we you know the water water management, the Mississippi water is part of a way of life uh, for us. So it's whenever we have conversations, whether it's around, you know, keeping the Mississippi River environmentally sound and clean or managing it as, uh, you know, as the, as uh, uh, during times uh, of uh, potential flooding, um, it, it, it's never anything that's seen as a, a minimal concern. It's always, cons it's always part of a, a dominant, uh, concern and narrative here in our in our uh, area. Great, thank you. 
A question did just come in from the audience. You don't need to read many mass media sources for very long before you come across stories about worldwide drought problems and specifically in the US West and Southwest. It seems to me that for the future, the great water asset of the Mississippi River should be an economic driver and population magnet for the central US. Is anyone looking at this aspect of the future of life in the Midwest? I'm gonna toss that to uh, Colin. Uh, <clears throat> yes, um, they, they are. As the mayor said, water's a way of life in, in her region of, of the Mississippi. Um, Louisiana is unique. It has 13 micro basins. So it's, it's constantly managing water and it's also managing our water. We send all our water down to her uh, to manage as do the other nine states. So they have a, a lot more to deal with. All that said, we actually um, are more worried about drought than anything else. Drought tends to last longer. It, it usually costs more money. Um, some of our most devastating floods have come in at about $6 billion in actual losses. The drought of 2012 came in at $35 billion in actual losses, and it involved a much larger area. We had uh, just a, a tremendous uh, crop loss, uh, and that led to increased prices at all the grocery stores in our cities. So <clears throat> it, climate change is, interesting because it it ironically causes more flooding and more droughts at the same time because the rain comes at very um, intense very short periods of time and then it's followed by long dry hot periods that are that are warmer than usual so we're experiencing a lot more days above 95 uh, than we ever have before uh, especially and that that's especially impactful for our our, our upper latitudes now, uh, companies are taking a thirsty look at our basin and our, our valley that are in places like California um, and in the Southwest. The uh, companies that use a lot of water that are in the Colorado River Basin have been looking at the Mississippi River Valley as a new home uh, because water is plentiful and it's cheap. Um, the Great Lakes, actually protect their their water um, with the Great Lakes Compact. So actually no one can put another pipe in the Great Lakes to take their water unless all the other local governments unanimously agree to that uh, and states. So we don't have any kind of compact for the Mississippi River yet, but we foresee the day where we, wait, we may need to have that in the future as droughts worsen in the West, the Colorado River Basin becomes more compromised and we are one of the last remaining um, confidently wet areas of the continent into the future. We're probably gonna have to protect that water uh, one way or the other. And um, so we see that coming down the road. Our mayors are part of the uh, National Drought Council. We helped get that passed into federal law. And Mayor Broom's counterpart, her co-chair, Mayor Gallagher, actually serves on that council uh, with the Department of Commerce or, or NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration runs that, that council. So that is a policy um, frontier we are very much engaged in. Thank you. Well, I know it's come up several times in the conversation that the Mississippi River cities and towns, the mayor's working, you all are doers, you're action oriented. Um, our audience also likes to learn how they can be action oriented. So for individuals living in our St. Louis area or even other areas, um, do you all have any tips for how we might be able to take action as individuals to support your work? Yeah, I, I will. And certainly uh, Colin can chime in. Uh, I'm gonna give you a perfect example. Um, Rotary International uh, has joined us in our work. Well, we, uh, and a lot of it has to do with our 
you know, plastic pollutions were cleaning, you know, litter management mitigation and things. So what's so great about that is that, you know, there are rotary clubs all over America and in every community. So whether you're a member of Rotary or not, I believe the Rotary example is a great model of how nonprofit organizations can certainly be a part of number one, you know, helping with some of these environmental issues that uh, impact all of our communities. I don't know about you, but you know, one of my top priorities uh, is certainly lit litter uh, mitigation here. And I, I was watching the other day as I walked uh, around my levee, how, you know, unfortunately uh, so many people um, have a culture of littering and it was in the water, you know, in, in, in some of the fountains near the in levee and on the Mississippi. So, you know, education campaigns, awareness campaigns, uh, are certainly uh, applicable and easy to uh, uh, implement, right? Uh, and Rotary has been an excellent example of a nonprofit getting involved in communities uh, around um, America uh, through their involvement with MRCTI. Colin, do you want to expand on that a little bit? Um, now, that was a great example, Mayor. I'll just say, uh more locally, uh, St. Louis is a is a pl plastic pollution initiative pilot city, along with Baton Rouge um, and St. Paul. So St. Louis's event is going to be on April seventeenth. Their kickoff event at Riverfront Park up on the north side, uh, right up against the river. It, it borders uh, Highway two seventy on the north side of the park and the Mississippi River on the east side of the park, and it's it's right on the city's edge. So, uh, and that's going to be uh, starting at 9 a.m. on April 17th. It's actually one week right after Mayor Broom's kickoff event in her own city. Okay. Uh, so she'll actually, we're going to go against the current. She'll actually kick it off on April 10th. We'll have one here in St. Louis on April 17th. And then we'll, we'll have one in St. Paul, Minnesota on uh, April 24th. It's the, it's the next Saturday. Uh, so right, right around Earth Day. So that's a great way. Um, you can use the app on your phone, um, engage with local mayors. Uh, Rotary International is a big partner for Mayor Broom in her neck of the woods. Uh, she actually has the third uh, largest uh, Rotary in the world in her city, her Rotary Club. So it's, it's, it's really, really going to be um, monumental there. Rotary is involved here in the St. Louis area but also a lot of other environmental groups um, and, uh, like the Sierra Club and, and others that have uh, partnered with us to really uh, make this happen. Plastics is pervading every area of our lives now, and it's, it's probably not going to go away, but it can sure be better managed. Uh, and we could probably reduce a lot of how much leaks into the rest of our world from where we do need to use it. Uh, so that's a, <clears throat> That's a big hands-on uh, example of where you can get involved. The other is if you're part of an organization or you're part of a group and you're having an event around uh, water management, infrastructure, cleanup, disaster resilience, habitat, any of those issues, invite your mayor. Invite the mayor that's near you, whether they're part of our group or not, but get them involved. Um, I know, Mayor Broom, you, you, you receive a lot of in invitations, but I know you love to receive a lot of invitations from things going on in your community. I'm sure you can't make them all, but just having your, your team involved and you involved and invited means the world. So um, just really in involve your mayor and it, it, I think you'll see it's a, it's a great, it'll be a great partnership. That's great. Thank you. Would either of you like to end with any last comments to share with our audience? Well, once again, I would just like to um, thank um, um, you all for inviting uh, me to participate in this uh, event today. Um, 
you know, um, it's not every day that I get to talk to um, folks at who are associated with a uh, museum. So uh, hats off to the Missouri History Museum. And once again, to uh, this uh, wonderful exhibit that's uh, kicking off. Uh, so I, I'm very delighted to have shared our vision with you all surrounding the mighty Mississippi River. Um, I, I'm so delighted to be a part of this conversation and hope that uh, the listeners have gained insight about MRCTI. Uh, we work hard uh, for the mighty Mississippi River and uh, certainly we hope that you will become more engaged with us and our work. We'd welcome you to do that. So thank you so much. Thank you. Mayor Broom, thank you again for being here today, for taking time out to join us in St. Louis virtually to share your knowledge and your encouragement. Um, it was really wonderful to hear from you. And also Colin, thank you. And again, for the collaboration with MRCTI. I am going to share my screen one last time to just mention a few programs coming up here as part of our virtual programming series, STL History Live. We have programs every Tuesday at 11 o'clock and every Thursday evening at 6.30. We have one this Thursday evening, the 25th, Women Making War, Female Confederate Prisoners and Union Military Justice. We are going back to Mighty Mississippi Inspired Programming next Tuesday at 11 for a Mark Twain program focusing on his life. And I also want to mention, and I just dropped a link in the chat, we would love for everyone to join us for Earth Week, April 19th through 23rd. We are hosting the Global Freshwater Summit, talking all about our freshwater biome of the Mississippi River in our area and throughout the middle America. We are hosting speakers from across the region, the nation, and even globally. Um, MRCTI will be back joining us. Um, and we are, we are so excited for this summit coming up in about one month. Registration is now open and it is a free summit, five days of programming that you are able to watch at no cost. Um, so thank you again to our sponsors for allowing us and our members for making things like that happen. Um, and audience, thank you so much for tuning in today. We really appreciate everything. We'll see you next time. Bye everybody. <laughs>